Hello YouTube, Dave here again. Welcome to the second installment in the Let's Make a Character series, a video series where I put up polls for you guys to vote on to see which character I'm going to be making each week, or at least hopefully each week. This is, like I said, the second installment. In the first video, we made a Pathfinder 2nd Edition character, and today I'm actually kind of excited for this because when I put up the options, I try to have a bit of a range of different systems, uh, different genres to choose from. And I was really surprised to see that 4th edition Dungeons & Dragons actually won the voting poll. It's just kind of somebody who loves 4th edition and uh, wants to see, you know, 4th edition get more of a chance by people. Uh, this was a really cool, uh, this was a really cool result. One I wasn't expecting, but one I'm more than happy to go along with. I was also thinking of doing this as like the D&D Essentials, like from the starter set to making a character using the options in there. Which I might do in its own separate video because it takes the form of a choose your own adventure, like solo kind of thing, which is kind of neat and interesting. But I decided that for today, we are going to be using the fourth edition hardcover player's handbook. So we're going to be making a character here. I do have my character sheet. Uh, I just did a Google search for fourth edition D&D character sheets, and uh, this one was on there. Uh, so yeah, it's just the basic uh, character sheet from the player's handbook, but there are a few interesting things to go over. For example, your fortitude, reflex, and will uh, saving throw bonuses are no longer tied to just one specific ability score. This is kind of an earlier version of what we would have in 5th edition, where every attribute has its own saving throw to go along with it. But for Fortitude, for example, you can use your Strength or your Con modifier, whichever is the better of the two. Uh, for your Reflex, it can be your Dexterity or Intelligence, so your Agility or your ability to understand you know, like your own weaknesses or openings and tactics and stuff like that. And then for your will saving throws, it's the best between your wisdom and your charisma. So yeah, just, again, just kind of cool to see because uh, you would have situations where, like, for example, the wizard or sorcerer, uh, the wizard in particular, uh, actually, I guess either one of them, uh, in 3rd th edition 3.5, they had a really good will saving throw, but the, the wisdom score was not one of their major attributes. So they would have the good save bonus, but usually a poor ability modifier to go along with it. Um, so to be able to use sort of a choice between like two different options there, and you can see how the arrows kind of go across um, and, uh, and all that. So yeah, really, really cool stuff. So we're just going to get right into it here. So we have our fourth edition player's handbook. So the first thing we're going to do is grab our scrap paper, which is just the other side of the Pathfinder second edition uh, thing because I forgot to bring some scrap paper down. I've got some loose leaf somewhere. I just don't know exactly where it is. Uh, but we're going to go and take a look on how we're going to derive our ability scores. And I'm going to use the first method that is listed in the player's handbook. So we do have uh, generating ability scores. So uh, the method one is the standard array, which again would become sort of a uh, an option that we would see in uh, fifth edition. The standard array kind of replaced rolling stats as the main way, or the at least the official way, because if you went to Adventurers League, for example, like organized play, you'd have to use the standard array. And <clears throat> there was stuff like that for uh, fourth edition as well. You had like D and D encounters. Uh, which was their organized play. And then you also had like Layer Assault, I think was another thing that they did for a while, which was more like just a combat oriented, like dungeon crawl type of thing. Uh, but yeah, because they did have a heavy emphasis on organized play that they themselves were running and overseeing, uh, the standard array puts everyone on equal footing. And those give us ability scores of 16, 14, 13, 12, 11, and 10 which are not bad ability scores to have. So we're just going to write those down here. We got 16, 14, 13, 12, 11, and 10. Uh, so we are going to be making an Elven Ranger character. That's going to be because it's my favorite race and class combination. And it's one that I always try not to make when I get the chance because it, it's like, oh, it's my favorite. So, you know, it's obvious that I would choose it. So why don't I try something else? And I haven't actually played a ranger character in, like, decades because of that. So I'm making a gosh dang ranger. Uh, and it's going to be an archery-based ranger. I've already made that decision. So when we've got our uh, ability score stuff here, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit on the sheet. 
And so we are going to have our 16 go into dexterity. So I'm just going to write that here first. So we got dex. Uh, I also want a halfway decent constitution. So, uh, you know, I want to have some hit points. Uh, but I think I'm going to put the 13 in con. And I'm probably going to put the 14 into strength because there are going to be situations where I am going to need to use melee attacks. So we're going to put those there. And then we're going to do, say, we'll say 12 intelligence, 11. Uh, actually, no, let's do, let's do 12 for the wisdom. And then we will do intelligence and charisma. So there we go. So we have our stats. The next thing we got to do is determine our race, which we already know what that's going to be. So let's just zoom back out here. So we are going to be an elf. In fourth edition, you had the Eladrin, which were like the gray elf or the high elf. Uh, but we're going to make ourselves, um, they're sort of more like from the Feywild type of thing. But we are going to make ourselves an elf. So these are like the wood elves, basically. Uh, in the player's handbook for third edition, you had the high elves were kind of the standard. Uh, so here we actually do have a choice between the uh, like the high elf, basically, and the, uh, and the wood elf. And the wood elf is the one that I want to make. So... Uh, their ability scores are plus two to dex and plus two to wisdom. So that's going to put our dex up to 18. And uh, the wisdom is actually kind of cool. So that puts us up to 14. So we got an 18, uh, two 14s, a 13, 11, and a 10. So that's really cool to see. Our languages are common and elven. Uh, skill bonuses. Okay, so we got to write some of this stuff down. So on our character sheet, we'll zoom in on the character sheet here. Because I do plan, I do have a PDF version of the uh, player's handbook, so I do plan on taking a few screenshots for things as I'm doing this. So for the size, we have a size of medium. Our race is going to be elf. And I'm, my handwriting sucks normally, but I'm also reaching around a tripod <laughs> with my arm fully extended to try to do this. Uh, our alignment's going to be chaotic good, so CG. Uh, DD will be Coralon. Uh, class is going to be Ranger. We are going to be level one. However, I do plan on holding on to at least a few of these characters, and in the future, I will do videos just going through the leveling process. Uh, all right, so we know what our ability scores are now. So we've got the score and the modifier. So the score goes on the left, modifier goes on the right. Uh, then we have a section for modifier plus half your level. So in 4th edition D&D, &D, uh, lots of things add half your level. Um, so your proficiencies, your attack bonuses, your saving throws, uh, your armor class also gets added to that as well. You get 10, 10 plus half your level for that. Um, now at first level, it's just going to be the, our straight ability score modifier because you always round down if you have a 0.5. It goes down to the nearest whole number. And they do cite um, the uh, for like half your level as an example of being rounded down. So at second level, all those will go up by one, uh, but we don't have second level yet. We just have first level, but our strength score is going to be 14. And it's just like 3rd edition D&D, &D, uh, like the modern 5th edition D&D, &D, Pathfinder 1st, 2nd edition Starfinder, all those systems. A 14 gives us a plus 2, so a 10 would be plus 0, and then for every even number above 10, you get an extra plus 1 to the ability score modifier, so we're going to get plus 2. And we're going to get modifier plus half level is going to be plus 2 because we are first level, and 1 divided by 2 is 0.5, and that gets rounded down. Uh, constitution is going to be 13. And now Constitution is important for your character's hit points in 4th edition, but it's not the same way that it works in like 3rd edition or 5th or edition. We will get to that momentarily, but our modifier is going to be plus 1. And our modifier plus half a level uh, rounded down is still going to be plus 1. Dexterity is going to be 18. And I'm bad at 8s on a normal day, so I'm trying to do this with like at the edge of my reach is not easy. That's going to give us a plus four. And plus four because, again, we're rounding down and uh, from our half of level one. Intelligence is going to be 11. So it's going to give us a plus zero and a plus zero for that. Wisdom is at 14 because we did get a plus two bonus. So that is going to put us at 
8 plus 2, and then plus 2, and then we got a 10 charisma, which gives us another plus 0, and then plus 0. Okay, perfect. Now, the elven languages are going to be common and elven. And our, let's see, our speed is going to be, so in 4th edition D&D, the speeds, distances, ranges are all expressed in squares because it was intended for you to use a grid because they sold grids, maps, um, battle maps, stuff like that, as well as they had a line of miniatures. So it makes sense that you would want your role-playing game to take advantage of those other things. And that's one of the common things that I hear a lot of people complain about when it comes to 4th edition D&D, but it's really not that bad because what I'm going to do is express things instead of squares. I'm just going to do it in feet. So the speed, uh, which is right here, is going to be, so normally it's seven. Uh, so seven squares, each square is an inch, each uh, square represents five feet. So we're just going to have a speed of 35 feet. So there we go. There are some other modifiers to the speed, but we don't have uh, to worry about that too much right now. Um, so actually, I probably should have waited there, but the base is going to be 35. I don't think anything that we have is going to uh, to modify it. So like basically, you're, if you wear heavy armor, it can reduce your speed, but we're not going to be doing that here. Uh, so we have group awareness. You grant non-elf allies within uh, 25 feet of you. A plus one racial bonus on perception checks, which is actually kind of cool. Uh, they do get some natural skill bonuses. So we have our skills down here, right? And you can see there is a, a spot for trained or for miscellaneous. So in the miscellaneous, I'm going to put a plus two next to nature. And perception. All right, uh, and then we've got their wild steps, so they can ignore difficult terrain um, when you shift, uh, even if you have a power that allows you to shift multiple squares. And they have the elven accuracy ability, which is pretty cool. So elven accuracy allows you to, it's a, it's a free action, and you can re-roll an attack roll, but you have to use the second roll even if the result's lower. So it's, it's a precursor to advantage, in 5th edition, but you are stuck with the reroll regardless of what it is. You don't get to pick and choose. If you decide to uh, to redo it, then you have to go with, uh, with the new one there. Uh, Alright, so Elven Weapon Proficiency, they're always proficient in the longbow uh, and the shortbow, uh, which is fine because the class is going to give us those anyway, so I'm not really going to worry too, too much about that. But we do have our Fey Origin. So the Fey Origin, your ancestor were native to the Fey Wild, so you are considered a Fey creature uh, for the purpose of effects related to a creature of origin. Uh, they have uh, group awareness. And again, I know my writing sucks. Um, so that when that is plus one perception, allies. Uh, and I'm just going to go 25 feet. There we go. Uh, and then we've got Wild Step. Which is Ignore. Difficult Terrain. While Shifting. Okay. And then we've got Elven Accuracy. Okay, so reroll attack, and that can be used in counter. So I'm just going to write counter in brackets next to it. Okay, perfect. So we've got our uh, racial abilities all thrown in there. We're just going to zoom out a little bit here again. There we go. Uh, all right, so that information is filled in. The next thing that we are going to do is we are going to go to the Ranger class.
All right, so for the Ranger class, and again, this stuff is going to pop up on uh, on screen here, but uh, this gives you the basic information for what the Ranger gets, what they do, some of their uh, proficiencies and all that stuff. So uh, class traits, we are a striker. So essentially we are concerned with combat and uh, just going in and dealing damage. Uh, our power source is Marshall. Again, this was before the Player's Handbook 2, where the Ranger probably should have been, so they could have been primal characters as well. Uh, so the 4th edition Player's Handbook Ranger wasn't as nature-oriented as we probably, as people probably would have liked. Uh, again, I don't know why they didn't just hold off for the next Player's Handbook, because that's where you had like the Barbarian and the Druid and the Ranger. It's just a natural fit for there, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, their key abilities are Strength, Dexterity, and Wisdom, which just so happen to be our three best attributes, so that worked out pretty well. So, multi so it just means that their class abilities uh, will likely use those stats uh, for those ability scores for different things. Uh, their armor proficiencies, you're proficient in Cloth Armor, Leather Armor, and Hide Armor. Uh, so we are going to be using probably Hide Armor for our character. Uh, they're also proficient in simple melee and military melee weapons. So uh, in like 3rd edition, and I can't remember if 5th edition does this back again or not, but you had like simple and martial weapons. Uh, so here they're called simple and military. Just a simple uh, change there. We're also proficient with simple range and military range, which is why I didn't bother writing down the short bow or long bow proficiency from our race, because that's all information that we're going to have, uh, or proficiencies we're going to have anyway. But... Here's where we need to start filling in some information. So we're just going to slide this off to the side a little bit here. Um, so uh, actually, you know what, let's just finish all the, the reading first and then we'll fill in the numbers. So their bonuses to defense. This is the equivalent of like which uh, saving throws you're proficient in in 5th edition or uh, which was your good save in 3rd edition. So they get a plus one bonus to both fortitude and reflex. Their hit points at first level is 12 plus your constitution score. Now, this was kind of a polarizing aspect of 4th edition, but it's one that I honestly prefer over the way that it's done, you know, nowadays or with 3rd edition, and technically even going further back. Uh, so, with 4th edition, one of the things that they really wanted to address was the fact that nobody wanted to play first level characters, because first level characters sucked in every ish edition of D, D, honestly except for fourth edition uh so for example if you were a wizard in any edition prior to fourth you had like one spell maybe two if you were lucky uh and once you used those spells your wizard character was the crappiest fighter in the group with no armor proficiency uh the worst attack bonus all of those things so a lot of times campaigns, especially like in 3rd edition, and I was definitely guilty of this as well, we would normally start um, with like 3rd through 5th level characters. And in 5th edition, the same thing is kind of true now because they went back to just like your hit dice and your con modifier type of thing. But they made you get through 1st and 2nd level so quickly that you may as well not have 1st and 2nd level. Like you still... By the time you're really starting most campaigns, and a lot of even their official campaigns, it's like, oh, it's good for first through whatever level, but really it's designed to start at like third level, right? And then, you know, have like a short little thing you can do just to get them to third level. So the fourth edition just wanted to make first level characters fun to play, to have abilities that they would be able to use. Like the wizard's magic missile, for example, was an at will ability, so they'd always have those to use. 5th edition did the same thing with their cantrips, right? So you just your wizard always has a magical ability that they can use. And that mentality came from 4th edition because they're like, yeah, we want people to play low-level characters and be able to enjoy playing low-level characters and be able to do something that feels rewarding or worth it as low-level characters. So 12 hit points plus your con score. So instead of using the a con modifier every single level you just add your constitution score as one chunk of hit points that you do at first level and then anytime your constitution score raises then you do increase your your hit points there 
And again, I kind of like it because with you're using your modifier, eventually your modifier is going to award you more hit points than the total number of your ability score. For example, if you had 12 constitution and we're getting plus one hit point per level, when you reach 13th level, you are now getting more hit points from your con than the con score itself. There was like no cap for it. If you had an 18 con, you would get plus four hit points per level. So by the time you reached fifth level, you had already exceeded um, hit points would be greater than your con score. So I kind of like adding the con score to your hit points at first level and then just increasing that contribution if your con score goes up. So that is going to be 12 plus our 13. So we're going to have 25 hit points at first level. And I know that sounds like a lot, but when I did my goblin test video uh, with the, uh, you know, with the, the first level fighter, uh, who had, you know, more hit points than that, <laughs> uh, he still, you know, went down pretty quickly because monsters have pretty decent attacks too. Uh, so we'll get into some of the other stuff uh, with that as well. But our Fortitude and Reflex are going to get a plus one bonus from our class. Uh, and then we've got our Healing uh, Surges. So Healing Surges is like a natural healing mechanic. It's similar to Hit Dice in 5th edition, but in my opinion... Healing Surges are actually utilized a bit better. Um, and that could be a whole other like discussion video, but uh, like even healing magic requires your body to be able to have the ability to heal from the injury. And the healing surges, like so like a cleric's cure abilities will use a healing surge. You drink a potion, it will use your healing surge. At first I hated that, but the more I think about it, it's like, you know, there are so many. Uh, like fantasy novels, even in the D&D world, that will have a cleric say something like, well, their injuries are beyond my ability as a healer. But mechanically in the game, it doesn't work that way, right? So um, to have the, the healing surges, it's like, well, their healing surges are used up. Their, natu their body's ability to recover is just simply spent and there's nothing I can do right now. So I actually kind of like that. So we do get uh, five, uh, or sorry, six healing surges, plus our con modifier. So for healing surges, uh, we are going to get uh, seven. So six plus our one for our con modifier. And our healing surge value. So we may as well do that now. So let's just set this aside. I had, I had the stuff up on the screen long enough. Hopefully you guys were able to read it. Um, so the healing surge value. We, so we have our max hit points of 25. In 4th edition D&D, you have something referred to as being in a bloodied condition. Uh, now, certain things may trigger when a character or a monster reaches their bloodied hit point value. Uh, for example, like a dragon will get like a desperation breath attack off as like a reaction to being dropped to their bloodied value. And that's just half of your hit points. Now, again, our hit points are 25, which is an odd number. So half of 25 is going to be... Um, 12.5, but we don't have like 0.5s, so we round down our bloody value is going to be uh, is going to be half of that. So it's, or it's going to be 12. So when we get reduced to 12 hit points, uh, we are considered to be bloodied. So again, certain attacks might deal more damage against a bloodied enemy. Certain creatures may focus their attacks on a bloodied enemy. Certain abilities that a character has might trigger when they're in the bloody condition. Uh, so we have that. And then we have our uh, healing surge, which is half of our uh, bloody value, basically. It's one quarter of our maximum hit points. So that is going to give us uh, a healing surge value of six. So when we spend a healing surge, we regain six hit points. You can regain them after a short rest to do some natural healing or again, uh, if you use magical healing, it requires your body's ability to actually heal. So we use that. Another cool thing that healing surges are used as is like a form of like tracking injuries and exhaustion during like lengthy travel sequences. Rather than have you like take damage that you just heal back the next day. Uh, if you're like getting exhausted or going on like a perilous uh, travel and you sustain injuries, it reduces the amount of healing surges that you have available to you 
until you can actually get to a place to comfortably rest, which I think, again, is kind of a cool mechanic. But anyway, uh, so yeah, so we got that information filled in. We do also have our train skills. So being trained in a skill in fifth edi or fourth edition D&D gives you a plus five bonus. You don't have skill points like you did before. It's just a plus five bonus that you get. Uh, so we are automatically trained in our choice of Dungeoneering or Nature. And we are going to take Nature. Uh, and so we're going to be trained in that. Uh, we do have the trained modifier here. So Nature is going to give us plus five. And then we have our choice of four from the following list. Acrobatics, Athletics, Dungeoneering, Endurance, Heal, Nature, Perception, and Stealth. Uh, so we're going to take, we want Perception and we want Stealth. So that's going to get plus five, so that's one of them. Stealth is going to get plus five, which is another one. Uh, I also do want uh, Athletics, because that's like climbing and things along those lines. So that's going to be plus five, so that is three. And uh, let's do Heal, actually. So we can use, uh, like, natural medicine and stuff like that. Uh, so those are going to be our trained skills. Uh, I'll fill in the ability score modifiers and all that stuff uh, in a little bit. All right. So the ranger also gets, for their class features, they get a fighting style, the hunter's quarry uh, ability, and prime shot. So we are going to be making ourselves an archery ranger. So for the archery fighting style, uh, it says because of your focus on ranged attacks, you gain defensive mobility as a bonus feat, which we'll look up in a, uh, in a little bit here. Uh, but we've got our class features, so that is going to give us uh, archery fighting style. And for feats, that is going to give us the, was it defensive mobility? Yep. So we have defense mobility as a feat there. Uh, we also have the Hunter's Quarry. So once per turn as a minor action, you can designate an enemy nearest to you as your quarry. Uh, once per round, you deal extra damage to your quarry. The extra damage is based on your level. Uh, if you can make multiple attacks in a round, you decide which, of, which attack to apply the extra damage to after all the attacks are rolled. So one of the things that 4th uh, edition... And 5th edition to that to followed suit, uh, it wanted to eliminate um, having you waste your class abilities by having to declare them before you know if the attack roll hits. Like the Paladin Smite is a pretty clear example uh, of an ability that you had to declare ahead of time. And if you missed, it's just wasted. Uh, so uh, Hunter's Quarry also replaces their favorite enemy ability. So instead of you choosing like a specific type of creature to deal your favorite enemy uh, extra damage or whatever it might be against. Uh, it's just you choose your quarry once per turn as a minor action, uh, which is kind of similar to a free action, or actually be more like a bonus action, I believe, in like 5th edition D&D. &D. Um, and uh, once you designate something as your quarry, it remains in effect until the end of the encounter. If the quarry is defeated, then you can choose another target. So right now, at uh, levels 1 through 10... The extra damage would be plus 1d6, so we're just going to do Hunters. And I'll show this sheet all filled out uh, at the end of the video. Hunters Quarry. Plus 1d6. All right. And then we get Prime Shot. So Prime Shot says if none of your allies are nearer to your target than you are, you receive a plus 1 bonus to ranged attack rolls against the target. So if you're if you're firing at something and you're closer to it than anybody else, you get a plus one uh, bonus to hit on it. Um, there, I think there are abilities like that in other systems as well. I, um, I want to say fifth edition has something similar to that. I I could be wrong though. Maybe three point five had something similar to it. But basically, it's kind of like the hunter aspect of like the character. So we got prime shot. Plus one ranged. If closer to target than allies. Again, just a little bit of shorthand uh, to write that down. All right. 
So the next thing that we got to do is we got to do our uh, encounter abilities our, and our at will abilities and our daily powers. So and uh, and we can actually go back to the beginning of the player's handbook here to see the level progression chart. So just bear with me here. Okay, so for character advancement, uh, and I should actually get a screenshot for this as well. But at first level, you get the ability scores from your race. You get your class features, racial traits. You do get one feat, which we will be choosing. Uh, your starting skills, you get two at-will attack powers, one encounter attack power, and one daily power. So we're going to go back to our ranger class. Or we're going to skip completely over it. Hold on. All right, so for our Ranger, the at-will ability that I'm going to select first is going to be uh, careful, an ability called Careful Attack. So that's going to go on our second sheet here. We do have our at-will powers, encounter powers, daily powers, and you start to gain what's called utility powers uh, beginning at second level. And those are things that you usually do like outside of combat, but we're not worried about those right now because we are a first level character, not a second level. So the first one that we're going to take is Careful Attack. And Careful Attack reads as follows. So it is an at-will ability, meaning that you can always use it. It is a martial ability, so requiring a weapon. Uh, it's a standard action, and you can use it with a melee or a ranged attack. Uh, the requirements is, is that you must be wielding two melee weapons or a ranged weapon. And we are going to be wielding a ranged weapon when we use this the most. Uh, and so it the, uh, the way that it works is you target one creature. And if you're doing a melee attack, you get your strength um, versus their armor class. Uh, so in 4th in edition uh, D and D, you can instead of having like fortitude, reflex, and will as saving throws, which I think I said before, uh, just because I've got so many other editions of D and D stuck in my head, they're not actually saving throws. They are like a defense, so it's a static number. And instead of you rolling fortitude, reflex, or will as a saving throw, enemy attacks will just simply target one of those defenses. So either your armor class for a physical attack, fortitude for things like disintegration or poison attacks. Uh, reflex for things like, you know, like fireball uh, and, you know, spells along those lines and will for things that target your mind. So um, it's it's a it's a defense rather than uh, rather than a, uh, a saving throw and your attacks or your abilities will tell you which attribute you use when calculating the attack roll. So again, for this one here, we're going to be using range. So we're going to be using dexterity versus armor class. But because it's a careful attack, it is dexterity plus two. So it's an ability that gives you an extra plus two to hit on your attack rolls. The trade-off is that if you hit, it simply deals one weapon die of damage and you, you lose adding your ability score modifier to it. So for range attacks in 4th edition, you get to add your dexterity modifier. Um, actually, I think you can choose between your dex or your intelligence, if I, if I recall correctly, uh, or certain things might. Uh, but in with this one, we're foregoing that extra damage to give us a better chance to hit. Uh, so if you're going up against an enemy that um, has a particularly high armor class, uh, then you may want to, like, instead of doing more damage with a lesser chance to hit, you have a better chance to hit for slightly less damage. So careful attack is just going to be dex plus two versus AC. And then on a hit, it's just one weapon die. Okay, so that is our first at will ability. Our second at will ability is going to be twin strike. Uh, no, sorry. It's going to be Nimble Strike. Nimble Strike is the one that I wanted to take. Um, I don't know why I said Twin Strike. I was just reading it on the page. But yeah, no. Uh, Nimble Strike is the next one that we want to take. So Nimble Strike uh, requires a ranged weapon only. So there are two abilities that are at will that can use either weapon. There's one that is specific to melee weapons with two weapons fighting. And one that's specific to ranged combat. 
Uh, so for uh, Nimble Strike, uh, the target is one creature, and the special ability of it is that we get to shift one square before or after we make the attack. Uh, then it is Dexterity versus Armor Class, uh, because it's a ranged attack. And on a hit, it is a regular like ranged damage. It would be one weapon die plus your dex modifier. Um, so the reason that we want that shifting is, again, kind of a, uh, a good ability to have because it doesn't trigger uh, attacks of opportunity. Um, so if you're like in melee range or if an enemy closes into melee range with you, but you still want to use your ranged weapon, then you can use Nimble Strike to shift out of their reach, fire the weapon, uh, and do that sort of thing. So And not worry about attacks of opportunity. Uh, so we're just going to go for Nimble Strike. Uh, sh uh, shift uh, before or after ranged attack. Okay, I'm just going to abbreviate that. Again, just sort of short form. When I make 4th edition characters, what I will normally do is actually print out or type out their abilities formatted similar to what they are in the player's handbook. On my computer, color code them to like highlight the name of the ability in the relevant color, and then print it off. But we're, we're not going to do that today. We're just going to you know do the, the basic information here, and then for our uh, at uh, our encounter ability, we are going to be using we're going to be taking the two fanged strike. So two fanged strike is an encounter ability. You can use it once in an encounter. Um, so meaning that once you take a short rest after combat. You can use it again in the next uh, fight that you come across. They are typically more powerful than your standard attacks, um, so which is always good to see. Um, but yeah, so with Twin Fang Strike, uh, it is a standard action. The requirement is uh, you must be wielding two weapons or a ranged weapon, which we will be. Uh, the attack is going to be, it's, it's against one target. Um, but we actually get to fire off two attacks at that one target. Uh, actually, something else I should mention is that your abilities in 4th edition, like your attack powers or, you know, the powers you get for your classes, um, also come with flavor text, which is just kind of cool. So it's it's a way to help you, uh, it's a way to help you kind of like learn to narrate what you do in combat, which I think is kind of cool. You can use it as sort of a template. So for Two Fang Strike, it reads, you slink two arrows, or sorry, you sink two arrows uh, or both of your blades into the flesh of your enemy, causing it to howl in pain. Uh, for Nimble Strike, it says you slink past your enemy's guard to make your attack, or you make your attack and then withdraw to a more advantageous position. So it's kind of cool uh, to see like the flavor text that you can use uh, as a basis for narrating your abilities. I, I just think that's kind of a neat, a neat option. Uh, so yeah, so for encounters, two fang strike. I'm just going to put page 105 because I don't want to write all that stuff down. Uh, but it's one target, one enemy, and then you make your uh, attack roll, which is going to be dexterity versus armor class, and you actually roll two separate attacks. So you get to fire off two arrows. You roll for each one separately. On a hit, uh, it would be one weapon die plus your dexterity modifier uh, for uh, per attack. So for each one that hits... You get to roll your dice for your weapon and add your relevant ability score modifier to it. If both attacks hit, you deal extra damage equal to your wisdom modifier, which again is kind of cool. So if both attacks hit, you get to deal a little bit of extra damage, which is nice. Then we've got our daily ability. So this is our big major attack that we need to get a long rest in before we can use it again. And the one that we're going to be taking is Split the Tree. Or Break the Lead. So Split the Tree. Uh, it reads, you fire two arrows at once, which separate in mid-flight to strike two targets. Uh, so it is our daily ability. It targets two creatures, which have to be within three squares of each other. Uh, and the attack is uh, Dexterity versus Armor Class. And if you hit, it deals each attack, if it hits, deals two weapon dice plus your Dexterity modifier. So you fire these. It separates suddenly uh, mid-flight. That kind of throws the targets off guard. 
and it strikes them for uh, for extra damage, which is kind of cool. And that's just going to be on page 106. And then we got check boxes next to the, the listed powers. If you've used it for the encounter for the day, you can check it off. All right, uh, we are looking pretty decent here. The last thing that we need to do is to get our equipment. And then we're pretty much done. It's just filling in the final details. So uh, for our, oh, we need to choose our feet, right? Uh, we have our skill proficiency. So for feats, I already know what feet we're going to take. Uh, we are going to be taking the weapon focus feat. So weapon focus, uh, it reads, the benefit is choose a specific weapon group such as spears or heavy blades, or in this case, we're going to be choosing bows. You gain a plus one feat bonus to damage rolls with your chosen weapon group. At 11th level, this increases to plus two, and at 21st level, it increases to plus three. So it's actually on damage rolls instead of attack rolls, which I think is kind of neat in 4th uh, in edition. In the 3rd edition, weapon focus gave you a plus one bonus to hit, but in 4th edition... Weapon Focus gives you a plus one to damage. So we're going to put on your feats. We're going to do Weapon Focus. And we're going to do bows. Plus one. Damage. Awesome. So now we're going to go to Equipment. And for characters in 4th edition D&D, &D, your starting equipment uh, value is going to be 100 gold. It's just the same for every character. It's not like different character classes will have different options for you. It just says when you create a first level character, you start with 100 gold pieces to spend on armor, weapons, and adventuring gear. Which is what we're going to do. <clears throat> so, for our armor... Uh, which we are going to put, yeah, so our armor, we're going to put into uh, equipment or other equipment. Uh, so we are going to be choosing hide armor. So the way that everything works here is uh, you got your armor chart. Uh, we do have the armor bonus, uh, the maximum, or sorry, minimum enhancement bonus. Um, those are going to be for like other, like kind of like master craft type of items. So for hide armor, you've got like dark hide armor, for example, which gives you more of an armor class bonus, but it does require uh, that it is also like a magic item as well. So we're first level, we're not going to worry about that. Then we have check, which is negative one. Uh, so this is a check that is made, uh, it's a penalty to all strength, dexterity, and constitution based skill checks when you wear the armor. You don't take the penalty to checks uh, such as like a strength check to break down a door or a dexterity check to determine initiative or anything like that. But if you're doing like acrobatics, uh, for example, then the armor will be sort of cumbersome for that. Um, or if you are making like some sort of constitution check uh, for like endurance because you're doing like a force march, uh, that kind of thing, like the armor can affect that. Uh, so we have that. Uh, our speed is not decreased, so we don't have to worry about that at all. Our price is a 30 gold, and the weight is going to be 25 pounds. Um, so yeah, let's fill in our armor information. So uh, 10 plus half our level on the character sheet here is going to still be 10 because we round down. Uh, the armor bonus is going to be plus 3. Uh, we don't get a bonus for a class, for armor class or anything like that. Uh, we don't get anything for feats or anything like that, but we do have our uh, dexterity. Which I don't know why that's not in there. Interesting. Uh, I guess I'll just go under miscellaneous uh, for now. So we'll just put our plus four into there. <clears throat> and we are going to have a 17 armor class to start. All right, up next we have our weapons, and that was uh, 30 gold of our 100. I already chose the items that I wanted ahead of time, so I know the, the math is going to work out. Uh, so then we're going to go to our weapons. And uh, the first weapon that we're going to be taking is obviously going to be our longbow. So we got under equipment, hide armor, and then longbow. All right, so the longbow, military range weapon. 
in fourth edition D and D, instead of having like a base attack bonus or like a Thaco adjustment or things along those lines or an attack matrix that's different for each character class, um, you actually have uh, just your basic when you're rolling with something you're proficient in. You will make the D twenty roll. Uh, you add half your level because you're proficient. You add your relevant ability score modifier as dictated by the ability that you're using. So with the bow, it would be dexterity uh, that you'd be using for the basis of that. However, uh, weapons will have proficiency bonuses that they add to your attack roll based on how like wieldable um, the, uh, the weapon is, the level of skill required to use it kind of thing. And they will typically go between plus two and plus three. So for our bow, just under our uh, basic attacks, we've got our bow and our, so the defense is going to be armor class. Uh, so the attack bonus is going to be dexterity, which is four, plus half our level, which is rounded down to zero. So it's still plus four, but the weapon adds a plus two proficiency bonus. So we are dealing plus six. Uh, the range for the longbow is 20 or 40 squares. So again, that's just going to be multiplied by 5 to uh, 100 or 200 feet. Uh, so we're just going to put in 100 slash 200. And our damage is going to be uh, 1d... Where is it? 1d10 for the longbow in 4th edition, and we do get to add our dexterity modifier to it, so it's going to be 1d10 plus 4. The next weapon that we're going to take, we do want to have a backup melee weapon, so we are going to also take a longsword. So longsword will be the next one. I don't know why I didn't write down longbow, but we're just going to... So longsword is going to be a military weapon. It gives us a plus three proficiency bonus, uh, which is good. It's 1d8 plus our strength, which is going to be plus two. So uh, our attack bonus is going to be our strength, uh, which is going to be plus two, uh, plus our proficiency bonus, which is going to be plus three. So it's going to give us plus five to hit. So not too bad, actually. We're pretty close between our longsword and our longbow, which is great. Um, the price on the longsword, I forgot to, to mention that, is 15 gold for the longsword. The longbow is uh, 30. So that is 75 gold that we have used so far from our 100 gold. But we have our armor, we have our weapons, and then we are going to go to our adventuring gear. So the first thing that we're going to get is a standard adventurer's kit that costs 15 gold. So we're up to 90 gold now. Of our uh, of our 100 gold has been spent, and the adventurer's kit uh, it weighs 33 pounds, but it includes an empty backpack, which is going to be filled with most of the contents. Um, it's going to contain a bedroll, a flint and steel, uh, a pouch, uh, so like a belt pouch. Uh, it's going to come with 10 days of trail rations, 50 feet of hemp rope, uh, two sun rods, and a water skin. Now I'm not going to write all that stuff down. I'm just going to go to our second sheet here, and I'm just going to write down adventure. Oh, I got to write down longsword, and then adventurer's kit, which fifth edition also does. Um, oh, fifth edition? Yeah, I think fifth edition does it. I think Path Pathfinder second edition did it for sure. Uh, so the adventurer's kit, and we're going to need a little bit of ammunition. So uh, for ammunition arrows, you can spend one gold piece to get 30 arrows total. So we're going to get uh, two quivers of arrows. So we're going to get 60 arrows. And that is two gold. So we've spent 90. We have 92 uh, gold spent so far. And I think that's where we're pretty much going to leave that off. So we spent 92 of our 100 gold. So we have eight gold pieces left over. And we've got our equipment. We have all of our other things chosen. All that's left to do now is to fill out the remaining details on the character sheet, and then our character is completed. So let's just do that right on uh, right on camera, no cuts. 
So our initiative is going to be our dex modifier plus half our level, which again is rounded down. So that is going to be plus four. Our initiative is going to be plus four. We do need to come up with character names. So let's actually go back to our handy dandy hero builders guidebook. And we're going to choose an elven name. Let's go with... Uh, let's go with Killian. I like Killian. So, Hero Builder's Guidebook, Elven Names, and we just went with Killian. So we have our character's name, we've got all that information done out here. We have our armor class already determined, so our Fortitude, our Fortitude defense is 10 plus half our level, which is still going to be plus 10. That's going to be 10, that's going to be 10. Uh, all right, so we have our um, we have our ability score. Oh, okay, I see. Under armor class, I'm looking at this from a distance. Under armor class, it is armor slash ability, so you're supposed to add the two together. I just separated out the ability score from the armor. Uh, but the ability score, so we can choose our plus two for strength or our plus one for constitution. So we're definitely going to go with plus two. So that is ten. Uh, 12, 13 for our fortitude defense. Uh, for reflex, it's either your dexterity or intelligence. So yeah, you better believe we're choosing uh, our dexterity. So that's going to give us a 15 total, one for our class, four for our race. So that's going to give us a 15 as a defense for anything that targets reflex. And then for our will... It's either going to be our Wisdom of plus two or a Charisma of plus zero. So I think we are going to go with that plus two. So our will defense is only 12, which is not, not the greatest. Uh, for action points, you start with one action point. It's just something you can spend uh, to take an extra action in combat. And there are abilities that you get later in the game that will have an extra benefit if you uh, if you use an action point. So you might like get an extra effect that you can add on to it. If it's an attack, it might deal extra damage. Or if somebody else uses an action point to take an action, you might get some sort of reaction you can use. Things along those lines. Uh, all right. Uh, attack workspace. So what we got here. So attack for that. Oh, those for abilities. Uh, I'm not going to worry too much about that because right now we don't have anything extra that we're really adding to it. And uh, we already got our attack numbers there. Um, but, well, you know what? Let's just do it. Uh, so half our level is going to be plus zero. Uh, so we're going to go uh, ranged, melee. Uh, so then we've got our ability score, which is going to be plus four for ranged. Uh, we don't have anything special for that. Proficiency. So we'll go, yeah, ranged, bow. Uh, proficiency is plus two. We don't have any other bonuses that we add to that. Oh, actually, crap. Uh, before I forgot, uh, with our bow, because we have weapon focus, that's actually an extra plus one, so we should be dealing plus five damage. I'm glad I caught that. Uh, yeah, so we don't have anything there. So our thing is plus six. And then for longsword. Uh, all right. We've got, actually, what I could do is careful attack. Bow, careful attack. Because that gives us an extra plus two uh, versus AC. Versus AC. So careful attack gives us an extra plus two, so that would be plus eight. Or plus seven, and the damage would just be one D10 plus one because of our weapon focus. And then one D8. All right, perfect. Uh, but yeah, so for that, we got plus zero for our melee longsword for half our level. Ability score is going to be plus two. We don't have a class bonuses or anything like that. Proficiency is going to be plus three. And that is going to give us a plus five. Perfect. Uh, all right, damage workspace. Um, yeah, why, why don't we do that? So longbow, just so we can see the breakdown. Ability score is going to be uh, plus four. Feet is going to be plus one, so that gives us our plus five. And then for longsword, 
We just have the ability of plus two, nothing else to add to it, so that's just going to give us plus two. And again, I'll zoom in on the I'll, I'll zoom in on the sheet so you can see it a little closer there. Uh, and then the last thing to fill is just going to be our skills. So uh, half our level plus ability score modifier. So acrobatics is going to be plus four because it's dex. Uh, Arcana is intelligence, and that is going to be plus zero. Uh, athletics is going to be plus two for our strength. Bluff is going to be plus zero for charisma. Diplomacy is going to be plus zero for charisma. Dungeoneering is going to be plus two for our wisdom. Endurance is going to be plus one for our con. Heal is going to be plus two for our wisdom. History is going to be plus zero for our intelligence. Insight is going to be plus two because of wisdom. Intimidate is going to be plus zero for charisma. Uh, nature is going to be plus two for wisdom. Perception is going to be plus two for wisdom. Uh, let's see. Religion is going to be plus zero for intelligence. Stealth is going to be plus four for dexterity. Streetwise is going to be plus zero for charisma. We're a ranger. We stay out in the wilderness, so we're not too worried about our street smarts. And then thievery is going to be plus four for dex. So, uh, going across here, acrobatics, we don't have, we're not trained. We don't have any other special ability modifier, so we get plus four. Our con is going to be plus zero. Athletics, we get two for our strength, five for our skill training, so we get plus seven there. Bluff is plus zero. Diplomacy is plus zero. Dungeoneering is going to be plus two. We just have our wisdom modifier. Endurance is going to be plus one. Heal is going to be five for our training and two for our wisdom. So that's going to give us plus seven. History is going to be plus zero because we don't have anything there. Insight is going to be plus two because it's just the wisdom modifier, no training. Intimidate is going to be plus zero. Nature is going to be uh, actually pretty good. <laughs> uh, we get two for our ability score modifier, five for training, and two because we're an elf. So that is going to give us a grand total of plus nine to nature. Uh, and it's going to be the same for perception because we get wisdom plus five for training plus two for being an elf. That gives us plus nine there. Religion is going to be plus zero. Stealth is going to be uh, plus nine as well because it's four for our decks and five for training. Streetwise is still a plus zero. And thievery is just plus four. So there we go. Our character is basically ready to go. Oh, no, 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 no not, not quite, not quite. Passive insight, passive perception. So passive insight is 10 plus our skill modifier. Uh, and insight is just plus two. So our passive insight is going to be 12. And our passive perception is going to be 19. There we go. Now we've got everything filled out. So let's just take a closer look at uh, the character sheet here. Just going over it all at once. We got our character information up here. So we have Killian. Uh, the ranger, he's an elven ranger, level one, medium-sized age. We'll have him be, uh, let's just say, 120 male. Uh, height will be five foot six inches. Weight will say 125. There we go. So that's our so that's our character's information. We don't have our paragon path or epic destiny yet because we are a first level character. I'm not going to commit to anything there until we get to that point. Adventuring company or any other affiliates, we're not too worried about that right yet. We have our initiative is plus four. And uh, our ability scores, again, we have 14 strength, 13 con, 18 dex, 11 intelligence, 14 wisdom, 10 charisma. Those are our modifiers there. Armor class of 17 with a fortitude defense of 13, a reflex defense of 15, and a will defense of 12. Our speed is 35 feet of movement. Because our armor does not restrict it in any way, shape, or form. Uh, I should put the negative one maybe in some of the things for the armor modifier uh, to our skills. But I'm not going to worry about that here. Uh, just because it is sort of can be situational as well. Uh, Alright, then we got our passive uh, insight. So our ability to sort of read people's uh, like body language and motives and stuff like that is 12. Our passive perception is 19, which is pretty good. Uh, our attack bonuses for our longbow is going to be plus six, so four uh, for our dex, two for proficiency for the weapon. Uh, longbow or long sword is going to be plus five, three for the proficiency from the weapon, two for our strength. Uh, we have 25 hit points, one action point. Uh, we have our fey origin, our group awareness, so plus one to perception rolls for allies within 25 feet of us. 
Uh, we've got the Wild Step, so ignore difficult terrain when shifting. Elven Accuracy, I get to reroll uh, one attack, or reroll an attack, and I have to use whatever the second result is. That's an encounter ability. Uh, we've got our damage of plus five at the longbow, four for dex, one for our feet. We have our plus two for longsword damage because all we have right now to add to it is our strength modifier. We've got our archery fighting style. Uh, we've got our hunter's quarry, plus 1d6 damage. Then we've got our prime shot, which is plus 1 to hit if we're closer to our target than our allies are. For feats, we have defensive mobility and weapon focus. Plus, Oh, I never looked up what defensive mobility was. I'll do that in a second. Um, and then for our skills, we've got all that information here. We speak elven and common. Then we've got our at will ability. So we have careful attack. So dex plus two versus armor class. One weapon damage on a hit. Uh, nimble strike. So we get to shift before or after making our uh, ranged attack. We have a two fang strike, which is on page 105. Uh, but this just lets you uh, fire two, two attacks, two arrows at the same target. Uh, and then split the tree, which we get to fire two target or two arrows. Each one strikes a separate target. They have to be within 15 feet of each other. And if it hits, it's two weapon uh, dice uh, plus your dex modifier because we're using it with our bow. Uh, then we got our equipment, which is hide armor, long bow, long sword, adventurous kit, and 60 arrows uh, with finally our eight gold left over. And that is our fourth edition character. Let's just take a quick look and see what defensive defensive mobility does because I completely forgot to do that. Um, so we'll go to feats. Okay, uh, defensive mobility, gain a plus, a plus two to armor class uh, against opportunity attacks. Okay, so if we do trigger an attack of opportunity, we get an extra plus two, which again, firing a bow at somebody when they're threatening you in melee could trigger an opportunity attack. So if they did that, we'd have an armor class of 19. So uh, pretty cool. Let's just actually write that in. Plus two AC versus opportunity attacks. Okay, there we go. That is our fourth edition D&D &D character in the books, or more accurately, on the paper. So yeah, this was a lot of fun to do, uh, I gotta be honest. And uh, I am looking forward to also, in the future, doing the D&D &D Essentials character creation from the Red Box starter set that they put out, uh, which is a choose-your-own-adventure sort of thing that can fill in the uh, the character sheet as you go. Uh, so that's gonna be kind of cool. At least I, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Uh, that's how I remember it, so I'm hoping that I'm right. Otherwise, I'm gonna look like an idiot more so than I already normally do. Uh, but I'm looking forward to that. And again, I just want to thank everyone for voting for uh, the fourth edition character creation. I really wasn't expecting that to happen. Um, but it's kind of cool to see that more people are starting to warm up to fourth edition uh, these days. I'm seeing a lot more people talking about it in either a, just a simply curious manner or even in a positive manner, which is really cool to see. And yeah, I just really like this version of the game. Again, like the squares put people off, but I hate to break it to you, old school D&D &D measured distances in inches because it was still based off of tabletop strategy games. So movement being related to like tabletop rep physical representation is a part of old school D&D &D as well. So like it's not the end of the world really. But again, I showed you how easy it is to just change from squares to feet. Instead of seven squares of movement, I just move 35 feet per round. It's really that simple. That's all you have to do uh, to make it work. It's it's really not that bad. But yeah, again, I had a lot of fun with this, um, and I want to thank the people that voted. And the new poll is already up, and I'm looking forward to seeing what people choose from that one. So anyway, thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you have any questions about you know D&D 4th Edition, um, if I can help you, I will just leave it in the comments below. Let me know in the comments below if you played or ran fourth edition, what were some of the favorite characters that you played in that version of the game? I look forward to it. And for those that are still anti fourth edition, you know, you can do whatever you want. It's fine. You can like what you like. Don't come to the comment section to be a prick about it, right? You know, people are allowed to enjoy what they enjoy. 
it should be that's where it should start and that's where it should stop so if you don't like fourth edition that's fine but just leave people alone who do because it's perfectly fine uh to to enjoy what they enjoy anyway thanks again i really appreciate it and i will see you all next time until then take care